Hello, I'm Portia Young. Welcome to another edition of 1036 here on Milwaukee PBS. In this episode, you'll meet Juan, who keeps Milwaukee's fire engines in tip-top shape. Hear how this job and the training he received helped change his life. And this story might just inspire you to grab your shoes and take a walk. We begin with a follow-up on our recent documentary, Kids in Crisis, You Are Not Alone, about youth mental health. The film features four diverse young people who share their struggles with bullying, depression, thoughts of suicide, transgender issues, and the juvenile justice system. It's also about courage, hope, and resiliency. If you haven't seen it, you still can. We'll tell you about that shortly. Whether you saw it or not, we have some new information surrounding the critical issue of youth mental health. Joining me now is Rory Lenane, a reporter with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, her series, Kids in Crisis, which she started when she worked at the USA Today Network Wisconsin, inspired this documentary. She was a co-producer on the film as well. Thank you, Rory, for being here. So let's just start first with the reaction that we've all received, that you've received from the documentary. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, the reaction's been incredible. Um, we've had over 150 people from uh, around the country asking to have copies of the documentary because they want to host their own screenings in their communities. Um, so we've heard from teachers who would like to show it to their classrooms, mental health professionals who want to use it with patients, and um, from a wide range of locations, um, from here close in Milwaukee with Clark Street School, um, as far as Stanford University in California, um, and even a few international requests from the Philippines and Singapore and Canada. That's amazing. We did hear from a psychotherapist, I, you mentioned this, that they were very thrilled, a psychotherapist in Richmond, Virginia, who was extremely grateful for having seen it online. Yeah, she was really excited to be able to use it with her patients because she works with teenagers who are experiencing a lot of the issues that we cover in the documentary, like bullying and depression. And um, she was looking forward to being able to share with them um, positive messages from kids who have actually been there and gone through these experiences and are now kind of on the other side and can give them some hope. And that's really the beauty of the piece is that it shows kids and young people that they are not alone on their struggle. Absolutely. And I think when you can see yourself and someone else, it really just helps you with that, that confidence that you need, that yeah. you can get through it. Okay, so you and the other producers, there were three key producers, yourself, Marianne Lazarski and Scotty Myers. You've been attending these screenings that we've had here in our area. What can you tell us about the ones that we've recently had? Yeah, um, the first screening we did was at Pius XI High School in Milwaukee, and um, we had 200 people come out for that, and we had the three, three of the four um, students from the film mm -hmm. actually on stage afterward for a talk back with the audience. Um, and we had some really great questions with that, and we have a clip here from one of those questions. Was it easy for you to talk to your parents um, about these issues, or did your parents notice changes in you and approached you or you approached your parents and got them involved? My mom has always been my best friend. She's always been able to read me and, you know, a lot of important people in my life have grown to be able to do that also, to be able to, you know, say, just by looking at me or when I call them and I pick up the phone and I say, hey, and they say, what's wrong? Oh, for sure. No, I'm good. No, don't lie to me. I can tell something's wrong. And so I think it's just, I think, for me, I, I wear my, my emotions out on my sleeve, and so I think I was able to go to my parents and be able to tell them, hey, this is what's going on, that kind of thing, because I trusted them 100%, but I know that there was no way that they also didn't see it in me. Oh, I don't know. So um, for my parents, the, they know me very well, obviously, because they're my parents, but <laughs> they, like, as soon as, like, I was being bullied or something like that, they'd, like, know immediately asking me, like, what's wrong? Because I always, like, had this sad face on, and I usually always go upstairs and cry in my room or something. So, it was pretty obvious, so I think they already knew. We also received great questions at screenings we did in Green Bay, Wausau, and this one in Appleton. 
how do you incorporate their hormonal imbalance with their mental health? So many people will say, um, isn't that just being an irritable teenager? I think there's something to be said about having those open conversations. That's a key. I always lock my kids in the car and they're trapped and so they can't get out and that's when we have those conversations. You don't have to be clinical about it, you know, you don't have to get into this is your amygdala and this is where you feel and yada, yada, yada. But you can also teach them something called emotional regulation. Um, when you were talking about breakups, that's the number one thing on the hope line. Number one, breakups. As parents and adults, we have this real tendency to say, oh my gosh, you're gonna forget about John. And yeah, you do when you're 40, but when you're 14, John is everything to you. And so really sort of having that moment of teaching them instead of preaching to them. And State Representative Joan Balwig from Markison actually invited us to screen the film before a meeting of the State uh, Suicide Prevention Task Force. Wow, and the producers and the four teens also received another exciting invitation from that state representative. Yeah, um, this fall she's planning to have a screening for the full state legislature. Wow, that is incredible. And again, we're hoping that this documentary and all your hard work on this series will really shine a light on this topic. It already has and create even more positive change. Thank you so much, Rory, for all your work and thank you for being here this evening. Thank you so much. You can still watch the entire 30-minute documentary at milwaukeepbs.org slash kidsincrisis. You'll also find a toolkit and additional videos to use at home and in schools to continue the discussion on youth mental health. 1036 sat down with Governor Tony Evers to discuss his plans to improve youth mental health issues. He also shared a personal story regarding this critical topic. I had a, a grandnephew who committed suicide and his, his um, several years ago, but it, it was it was an ugly end to a life, and frankly, he there was kind of signs all the way along that people just um, I didn't say ignored, but were hoping that he would get better, and he never did. And uh, and we see it. <clears throat> so that's a personal story, but I, I'm sure every extended family or almost every extended family can talk about the same things. But you see it in the schools. Uh, we we worked hard over the years to. Uh, raise the, um, the profile of, of um, mental health and uh, understanding how important, important it is to address it in the schools. And, and we've made a lot, lot, of, lot of good progress, but I, I will say, um, and kudos to the media on this, frankly, they, they've, uh, they've taken it to a different level and, and, and are seriously uh, addressing this. So I, I, think, I think we're in a good place to turn, turn this uh, uh, turn this around. Uh, people understand the seriousness of it. They understand uh, that they have to be watchful for signs that uh, might in indicate this. But uh, I just seen it. Uh, I've seen it uh, destroy too many lives. And uh, whether it ends in suicide or not, very few do. But it certainly impacts kids that um, uh, for a lifetime if we don't address it. <laughs> I would say primarily in, in when I was in the classroom in particular, that was a long time ago, and, and uh, you, you see it when, when kids aren't, uh, aren't opening up and, and uh, uh, you know, sitting back or sit silently, uh, aren't, aren't interacting well with their peers, things like this. And, and you try to draw them out, and, but it, it's extraordinarily difficult. You know, subsequent to that, uh, you know, after I've been, that was a long time ago when I was in the classroom, but we're, we're able to, uh, teachers and, and others in the, in the school arena, I think are becoming more attuned to issues like this. We, we, can't, we can't rely on them to uh, uh, pull themselves out of a, a depressant depressive state uh, and otherwise I, I think I think we what we need to do is look at uh, for those danger signs and, and those signs that uh, kids are struggling and have trauma and you know as we know and of course the media has been great in, in pointing this out is that uh, um, trauma 
uh, and leading to mental health issues can come from poverty, you know, and, and difficulty in the, in the struggles that family have around poverty. And, and so I, I think the data is much better than ever before. In two or three years, I, I would hope that we'd have, especially when we're talking about children, that there's regular screening around these issues. That's always a, tro you know, we school districts, some do it universally, some do it uh, with, you know, that uh, we they ask parents every single year. But I think universal screening is an important piece and, and that'll give us data that, you know, that A, we understand early on who, what child needs help, but also it'll give us some data points that, uh, that tell us that uh, the, the, it's either increasing or it's, or it's decreasing. I think, universal, I think screening is an important component. We need more and more uh, opportunities for th therapy and more and more opportunities, frankly, for uh, therapy and behavioral, uh, behavioral and mental health uh, uh, services to be right in the schools and that helps remove stigma. So I, I think we're an incomplete. I mean, we, we understand the problem much better than we ever had before. Uh, we need the resources to move this forward. And we've had budgets in the past that have begun to provide resources and this present budget that we're working on is gonna provide even more. Um, but uh, so we're, the trajectory, when I say incomplete, is because uh, we, we, we have a long way to go, but the trajectory is in the right direction. We have two arenas that we're, we're working in. One is the Department of Public Instruction budget where we've set aside several million dollars for making sure that um, uh, we, have, we have professional development opportunities for teachers, like uh, 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 mental health first aid is a good example of a program that we, we, we advocate for here at the state level where it helps teachers and others, you know, literally coaches, others that interact with youth on a regular basis to kind of understand the the, uh, the warning signs that might be out there. And then, you know, obviously, if you're not a trained therapist, you need to pass, pass, the, uh, pass, the, pass on to uh, somebody to take, you know, help that child. But so we're, spe we're spending a lot of resources to, to do that. We're also, we've also put a fair amount of money, millions of dollars in the budget for collaborative efforts with um, uh, private therapy uh, um, and, and other health care providers, whether it be hospitals or some other providers, to you know, help shoulder some of the costs that are involved with actually treating, uh, treating kids. And so we're, we're continuing to do that. And then, of course, our, our Medicaid expansion also has money set aside for dealing with mental health issues, which include kids. I fully expect that... Uh, the money we've set aside, especially in the DPI budget, will be will be funded. I mean, we had Republicans and Democrats, frankly, falling over each other last time to support that. We've we've upped the ante, no question about that, as far as resources. I fully expect that to happen. Where I do have concern is the uh, Republican Republicans' uh, reluctance to get involved with Medicaid expansion. That. That, that would be a problem because in order to access those resources, essentially $1.6 billion in resources of federal money, which a, no, a lot of that will go towards youth and youth health, mental health issues, we need to take the Medicaid expansion. So that'll be more of a battle, but I think the money set aside in the Department of Public Instruction's budget will be there. Republicans and Democrats understand this is an issue, so we're, I, I think we're in the right place. The new two-year budget cycle is scheduled to begin July 1st. Keeping Milwaukee's firefighting vehicles running safely is no easy task, but for one fire department mechanic, it's something he loves, and he credits some specialized training for helping him land that job. Openings for this job are far, far in between. I entered the, the automotive program in MATC South Campus. My instructor, he mentioned it to me and, and I thought it was a good idea, it was something different, so I did it. At the time, I was expecting my, my daughter. 
I wanted her to have a good life. The program uh, full-time was about a year. Uh, Part-time was uh, two years, but I did the one year, so I, I wanted to get it done as soon as I can. When I finished, um, I talked to my instructor, Joe Spitz. Shortly after I, I graduated, a couple days, I was working, and it's, it's been good ever since. The Fire Support Division has a number of different roles, but our primary goal is uh, we design it, we build it, we maintain it, fix it, and we also buy it. The students that come out of MATC have got a great uh, mechanical foundation, a solid mechanical foundation that uh, allows them to build off of, allows us to build off of. If you have a good foundation, which MATC provides in the automotive program, you can come here and you can, uh, that, that helps quite a bit. This is kind of a specialized field. With the foundation you got, everything else you will learn uh, here. Very few places offer any training for uh, fire trucks. The fire apparatus are, is so unique and so specialized that there's very few mechanics that have any of that kind of experience when we hire them. Majority of the mechanics that we hire, we need to have somebody that knows mechanics, has a great foundation, and from there we can we can teach them what they need to know about the fire apparatus. We buy SUVs from dealers. Uh, we have to uh, outfit them with lights, sirens, computers, and everything else that you would need, radios, so they can operate properly. All the vehicles, trucks, and the response vehicles have all those systems. We got to put them in there. The Milwaukee Fire Department has 30, 30 active stations where we respond to emergencies of all kinds. And we also have five support stations uh, ranging from our peer support, our, our fire bell club, our community relations building, and our recruitment station. Brakes are one thing that we do a lot. It's just based on the use of the vehicle. They're uh, running and stopping so, so many times. The brakes, they're bigger, heavy, So sometimes we'll need help uh, to mount certain things. Exhaust, suspension, I mean, whatever needs, uh, needs attention. Uh, we do inspections to make sure that uh, everything is, is where it, it needs to be and, uh, and tight, nothing's loose. And with the salt, corrosion, so it, there's a lot of things that go into getting these uh, things ready to, to work for the, for the firemen. The building is from the late, late 20s. Um, it was made to build 1920s, 30s trucks, fire trucks. What we have now, it's four times the size. It's a challenge uh, sometimes to, to, to get things done, uh, but we do get them done. But that, it's a beautiful building, yeah. It, you can see all the construction, the crane up top. It's a very nice building. It's a lot of shops, mechanics have their own stall or stalls, and they work on their own vehicles. And, you know, they interact as needed, but mostly they work alone. Here we work a lot more like a team. So not only are we looking for somebody that has the mechanical knowledge, but also has the right type of personality to fit in with us. Uh, we're looking for someone that has a sense of wanting to be part of the community and be part of something a little bit bigger than just fixing trucks. It's a very important job. Uh, we, we, uh, we work hand in hand with the, you know, with the firemen. They talk to us, we talk to them, uh, make sure that everything, we're on the same page. But definitely, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's important. You know, we gotta keep these things on the street and they gotta do their job. Summer's finally here. And that's a time for most of us to find ways to rejuvenate. This next story might inspire you to grab a pair of shoes and take a meandering walk. Circles, to be walked, for meditation, for emotional release, for thinking, to get to your inner self, and found in more places than you think. These circles are labyrinths. A labyrinth is really basically a spiritual journey. A meditation path. This walking prayer that needs no words and no agenda, it has a very healing effect. So much so that a labyrinth can be found 
at Aurora West Dallas Medical Center in the Women's Pavilion. Our labyrinth really is a chance for people to step out of the hospital setting. Here you hear wind and birds and water splashing. And it's a chance to then just be in a, a place where the rest of you can come to life so you can listen to your spirit, your heart. Located in the Garden District of Milwaukee's Bayview neighborhood lies another labyrinth. It's under the guidance of Pastor Karen Hagen, who's trained in labyrinth work. She said a labyrinth can have a calming effect that can lead to a healthier psychosocial well-being. All labyrinths are based on spiritual geometry, so the notion is that by walking the pattern of the labyrinth, it actually produces a change in your brain wavelength pattern. And so you can go in without an agenda, without a prayer in mind, or you can purpose your walk. Um, it's an ancient uh, practice found in all major religions, not just Christianity. Labyrinths aren't mazes. The way in is the way out. Um, this particular one, though, you can go in two different ways and come out two different ways, but it's not a maze. And so the notion is, is that you, as you enter, there's a letting down, you know, like that sigh too deep for words. And then as you walk the pattern, you um, are letting down, letting down, becoming more, um, perhaps more self-aware or more present at least. And as you go to the center of the labyrinth, there is a deep, a place of deep rest or oneness or prayer and you stay as long as is helpful for you. And then on the way out, it's about reintegrating that experience of oneness, of deep prayer, into the whole of your life and the whole of your being. It doesn't take any particular thought. And you know what it means if you don't feel like anything special happened? It means that you're not aware that anything special happened, but it did. And those kinds of happenings have taken place in downtown Milwaukee at Calvary Presbyterian Church, where an indoor labyrinth is located. We had a confirmation class a few years ago, um, and they came and walked the labyrinth. Then there were like 20 kids in there scooting around in their socks. And I thought, okay, is anyone gonna get anything out of this? You know, they're all racing around. And about a week later, I get this packet that has all these handwritten thank you notes. So I'm reading each one, and they're almost the same. And then I get to one, that says, thank you for offering the labyrinth. I didn't know what to expect, but as I walked, I felt God's presence, and I felt like God was helping me to stop cutting myself. You know, it's just lines on the floor, and yet being in this space, being in the sense of a sacred space, letting your mind wander a bit from where it usually is, she was open and she felt something, and, and it helped her. So we have no idea you know, what happens when people step onto the floor and let themselves trust the path to wherever it takes them. And there are paths to be taken if you look. On Milwaukee's near north side, there's Alice Garden on 21st and Garfield, which offers an urban retreat. We always invite people to, as they're coming into the labyrinth and following that path, to think about um, you know, where they are presently and what's going on um, on your life journey. There's just something happen that happens when you're following, um, you're, when you're intentional about your footsteps, right? Something really um, sacred happens when you understand that your life um, is a journey and this labyrinth is a living herbal labyrinth. So almost everything you see here, um, with few exceptions, are herbs. Um, they are meant to also um, induce healing, to invite you to a path of healing by their aromas, by what they represent. Another healing path can be found just behind St. Luke's Hospital on Milwaukee's South Side. And immediately west of Milwaukee in Wauwatosa is another labyrinth, where one can take a meandering walk, both spiritually and reflectively. And tucked into one of Milwaukee's North Shore neighborhoods sits a labyrinth on the grounds of St. Christopher's Episcopal Church. 
it's really spiritual reflection. It's, it's uh, you know, one among many kinds of things that people can do for uh, just nourishing their soul. Uh, you know, spending time, um, you know, in a spiritual sense, uh, it's a, it can be a form of prayer. It can be a form of meditation. Uh, it can be a form of just free thinking. Uh, there's really no rights or wrongs. There's really no prescription as to how to uh, do a labyrinth. So quell your thoughts from the chaos of the world. Grab those walking shoes, find a labyrinth, and relax your mind. Good idea. I might just try that. That'll do it for this edition of 1036. Remember to check us out on Facebook and at milwaukeepbs.org. We leave you with a view from above the Amsterdam Dunes Preservation Area in Sheboygan County. 